morning. Good morning. I uh, share with you again. Um, there's uh, home fellowship, we call them, uh, one on Wednesday night at the Blow Bombs house, and one on Friday night where they all drink coffee and stay up until midnight. So if you want to drink coffee, stay up till midnight after the Bible study and talk. Friday night's your night. If you want to go to the Geritol crowd, uh, oh, did I say that? If you want to go to the people who want to go to bed at 9 o'clock, then come on Wednesday nights and uh, you can call me for directions. We don't have directions. Um, uh, I need to get some cards made. But uh, anyway, I encourage you to um, take advantage of that as you, you know, see fit. It's a good place to go where there's more interaction, obviously, than a Sunday morning where we get to share and, you know, we read and, you know, more openness, fellowship, prayer, things like that. So, um, vitally important for each and every one of us that we, you know, we are participants, not just spectators. You know, unfortunately for churches, we become spectator sports and uh, that's not really what it was intended to do and it's not that all of us can come up and teach together or any of that stuff but uh, there needs to be a sense of participation you know somebody knows my name somebody you know uh, things like that so anyways um, I encourage you to take advantage of that also if you are musically inclined Thursday night 6 30 6 30 on Thursdays at practice here. If you want to come, you feel like, you know, you want to add to the flavor of the worship, uh, we encourage you to come and, you know, see where you fit and, you know, uh, take advantage of that. So, usually lasts for about an hour, I think, and uh, they run through the songs that they're going to be singing, but uh, there's room to grow. I mean, there's, there's, you know, room for participation. So, Anyway, uh, we are in John, and we're going to be in 19, um, and we're going to finish, go back to a couple of verses from 18, and I titled this, um, Who is on Trial in This Picture? And so we'll revisit that thought. But uh, there, the, um, the day of the crucifix and the crucifixion itself is broken up into uh, to six hours, basically. You have three hours where man does his part. In other words, man pours out his wrath and rejects it upon Jesus Christ and then you get to the last three hours when there's the darkness, and that's when God pours out his wrath upon his son. That's when the payment is made. Up to that point in time is man being, the way I would say it, is being indicted uh, by, you know, uh, our rejection, the world's rejection of Jesus and his claim to be the king, Messiah, and all of those different things. So I just kind of, if you take that into consideration as we, we go through this. But uh, um, Pilate is the authority of Rome. Uh, he is the final authority of judgment concerning this case. And uh, Pilate is obviously not going to want to do something here. He is going to find every way he possibly can not to have to make a choice or a decision. And yet he also, in the midst of what we're going to go through, we're going to see that he knows what the truth is. He knows what reality is because it has is, is already stood before him. That's what it's all about is who is Jesus. And Pilate ultimately knows that the guy that's standing in front of him is truth in, in a, uh, you know, in a revelatory manner, in other words, as light is given to him, that he understands the guy standing in front of him 
is, is not an enemy. He's not. He's he's somebody quite different, and he doesn't know what to do with this. He know what's he knows what's morally right to do, but he doesn't find the power to do it. And you know what, people? Uh, that that's the dilemma of mankind. Uh, it's the dilemma of those of us before we were Christians, and it's a dilemma for the people that we share with that are not Christians yet, is the what? The balance in between. What is going to happen to me if I commit? Even though they know they need to commit. Even every, you know, when people are, the gospel is shared with somebody, they know this is truth because the Holy Spirit bears witness of it, but at the same time they go, but there's all these other extenuating factors. And I would say this, some of you probably went to college. One of the things our colleges have been teaching, but it's a world philosophy that's been around for, you know, millennium, is situational ethics. If I do this, then this will happen, so the situation demands that I compromise and do something in between so that I survive in the midst of what I'm going through, right? Survival of the fittest, or the wisest, or whatever the case may be. So that's kind of the framework of uh, where I would put this today. So um, if you are with me, go back to verse 38 of chapter 18, and we'll pick up there. It says, Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault at all, or in him at all. This would be one of three times that he says the same thing. I find no fault in him. He's trying to get out of having to make a, a choice, and yet his words are, I find no fault in him. He's the authority of Rome. He could basically say, I dismiss the case. Go home. But that wouldn't change the outcome for him or for the nation or for the struggle because guess what? It wouldn't eliminate the conflict. The Jews still wanted Jesus dead. They still wanted him out of the way. So it wouldn't have changed the circumstances or situation for him even though he would declare him innocent that would not stop the conflict. You, I think you get what I'm, I'm saying here. But he says, I find no fault in him. By the way, Judas Iscariot said the same thing. This man's innocent. I betrayed innocent blood. You find that throughout the theme, uh, throughout Jesus' trial and his crucifix. Uh, is he's not guilty. People looked at him, and we'll explore this a little bit more as we go through this. But he says, I find no fault in him, even though he couldn't quite grasp all the things that he was saying when Jesus said, I'm a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. He understood that he was not a threat, that he was a guy that commanded respect. And one of the things that is amazing about this whole thing is Jesus doesn't cower. He speaks to Pilate as an equal, not as a subject. That's amazing. Many of us in this room, uh, or maybe online, uh, have met people that command a degree of authority and respect and leadership. They're rare, but there are those people that just stand up and they stand out and you know that they're going to speak the truth and they command a degree of authority because of their very lives and the very nature and character. And they are very rare people. Well, Jesus was the rarest of all, you know, but he's not cowering. Jesus understands that he came here to die. So death wasn't a fear, it wasn't something that could intimidate him. No, he knew he was going to die because he was going to die for us. And even for Pilate, believe it or not, Pilate was not his enemy. I believe he's trying to win Pilate here, but ultimately Pilate wouldn't step towards him. And ultimately Pilate found himself on the outside, if you would have it. So, but he says, I find no fault in him. 
But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They all cried again, saying, No, not, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. It says he's also a murderer and a thief in other places. We've already been through this. So they said, no, and this is his alternative. Okay, I'll slip them Jesus and give them the opportunity to get, get me out of this jam. Here, take your king. They said, no, we won't have him as our king. Give us the murderer and thieving Barabbas. And by the way, just as a prophetic picture, this is what the Jews will do in the last day when they choose the Antichrist. Is they will take, what, the son of the devil which is what the Antichrist is, as opposed to taking what? The Son of God. But they'll reconsider right at the 11th hour, the 59th minute, the 59th second, when they are ready to be doomed and they will cry out and say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then Jesus will return. They will embrace him as a nation, but they will also embrace the Antichrist before this. So it's kind of a little bit of a prophetic picture, if you would have it, just for those of you who are, you know, um, students of prophecy. So in verse 19, he says, Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Well, he scourges them. Now, a scourge, there's the Jewish whip, if you would have it, which the Jews would, uh, you know, ha have a whip, a type of cat and nine tails, but it's not the Roman cat and nine tails. In other words, strips of, of leather, you know, bound in a handle or on a wooden handle. The Roman one would be very long. In other words, the scourges or the, each of the tails would be very, very long. It would have, on the end of it, have a, a, a piece of glass, a piece of metal, a piece of bone. And what it was designed for was to rip the flesh and the reason you would scourge somebody is to get a confession from them okay and because the Roman uh, cat and nine tails was so long it wasn't something that would just hit the back you see the the, the Jews when they whipped somebody they would only do 39 lashes because they didn't want to break the law, they could do 40, but just in case they miscounted, they stopped at 39 in case they went to 40. They didn't want to go to 41, they'd be breaking their law. So that was why they did 39 lashes, but they didn't have glass. It was just a whipping. It was a beating, if you would have it. It would hurt, there is no doubt, but it was nothing like the Romans. And so when the Romans would scourge somebody, they would get their strongest guys to do it. They would get the most muscular guys and they would have repeat customers. In other words, a guy would put all of his strength into it, maybe do 10 latches, and then they would hand it off to the next strong man. And on top of that, the lashes themselves would not just hit the back, they would go all the way around the body. And so if they were lashing somebody up above the neck, which they probably, you know, then it would hit the face and it would rip open the face. Now, for those of you who know Psalm 50 or, or Isaiah 52, it says what? He was marred beyond what? Recognition. And there's something to this, not just for you to wince and not just for us to go, oh my gosh, you know, how terrible. It is, it is something of which I, I believe I, I, is going to be drawn out here by the centurion that says, surely this man was the son of God, or the thief on the cross of which we spoke of last week, that somewhere in the midst of this man just being totally beaten up and bloody to a pulp, 
He was still gracious as he hung on that cross. Every word that he spoke from that cross was a gracious word. You know, when all the world would have said, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I don't deserve this, you guys are all scoundrels, or, you know, whatever the case may be, that's not what Jesus did. He was thinking about others. He made seven statements, and all of them were positive. Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Can, who would do that? When their faith is bloody to a pulp, they've got a, the crown of thorns on their head, they've been beaten so they're swelled up. The back is no longer there, there's no muscles left, there's nothing but open flesh. Who would be gracious to anybody at that point in time? Jesus. And it commanded what? It commanded people to take notice because it was impossible for them not to take notice. Because he didn't revile people back. He didn't, you know, try to take a swipe at somebody. He didn't tell them, when I come into my kingdom, man, you're the first one. Off with your head! You know? As we would do. Do you not know who I am? I'm God. I'm going to nuke you. Your house. See, that's human nature, isn't it? Well, he doesn't have, he has a human nature, but he has God's heart because he's God. And he understands what he's doing is he came to pay for all those people who did all this stuff to him. And all of the rest of them throughout the years that have rejected and despised and thrown his name into the gutter and despised his people. He still loves them. He still loves them. Doesn't mean they're going to know that love because they have to open their hearts to know that love but he still loves them he still died so he scourged and uh, then they mock him as soldiers can do especially hardened soldiers like roman soldiers uh, they were not known for their niceties and their daintiness and their mercy and their compassion. They were not. They were not a merciful, compassionate army. They were an army built to crush their enemies. Uh, if you know anything about Roman soldiers, when they get defeated quite often, the Roman soldier, there were many areas where a Roman soldier could lose his life by his own authorities because of failure in certain things. There were times when they were defeated or cowardice, and they would go down the line, and every tenth soldier would be killed in a unit. And they were expected to stand there and take it. That's usually tyrannical armies. I mean, the Nazis did that, the Russians did that, the Koreans probably do it, the Japanese do it. I mean, that's that tyrannical, you know, um, no failure is acceptable in a, in a manner of speaking. So, um, these guys were hardened men. And they mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews! In a sense, taunting him. What are you going to do about this one? What are you going to do about that? Oh, we'll honor you as a king. Can you imagine them putting a robe on him as the blood begins to coagulate and then later they rip the robe off? How many of you used to like to have your band-aids when you were little kids? Oh no! Right? Iodine? Anybody remember the days of iodine? Yeah, well, rip something like that off of somebody's back where the what? Where the blood begins to coagulate, begins to dry, and then you rip it back off and open up the wound again. These were things that went on. You say, why are you being so graphic about it? Because it's important for us. Because quite often you, we can sit here and, and, and we can see Jesus as a victim. Jesus was not a victim. He knew what he was going through when he was in the garden. Let this cup pass from me, but not my will be done, but thy will be done. We don't live in a warrior culture anymore, but the ultimate warrior is Jesus Christ. Tomorrow, at cemeteries, military cemeteries, cemeteries here in this city, there will be people that will go there and remember the fallen. 
remember the fallen and honor the fallen. It's becoming less of a, a big deal in the United States, but uh, each of us should thank God for the people that have given their all, their last full measure for us, whether that be at Valley Forge or Vietnam or wherever the case may be, Iraq, Iran, or, or you know, Afghanistan, wherever. And it's not so much that they were all Christians, it's the fact that they were willing to what, step up and offer their lives as a sacrifice on our behalf. You know, and uh, warrior culture is, uh, is a strange one for those of us who are civilians. It's, an, it's a, because, you see, we watch movies or we see things and we see death in one manner. And so we cry and we say, well, this young person lost their life and, you know, how tragic that could be. When in a warrior culture, that's not the way that they see it. Oh, death is an end, but most warriors and those who fight, they know what they're doing. They know it can cost them their all. And it's always amazing. It's someplace where we can't really go unless we've, we've been there. And most of us haven't been there. We haven't been in places where people that we served with, you know, died. We don't really grasp that. The Germans, uh, there's a, a part in the Battle of the Bulge where there was a German unit um, that uh, was fighting against American 2nd Division in the Battle of the Bulge and a lot of German casualties. And, uh, and uh, a lot of these guys were had a lot of medals and what the Germans would do is they would lay out these soldiers they would take them out of their tanks or and they would lay them out with their medals and everything they would fold up their arms and most of them probably had you know major wounds that killed them but they laid them out because they wanted to respect these men and the way they respected them was not by hiding their bodies, but by looking at these men, seeing their medals, and knowing that they gave their all full measure for what? Their cause. Whether it was right or whether it was wrong. They wanted to honor their dead. They valued the sacrifice of these men. How much more should we value the sacrifice of our Savior? Because you see, He doesn't want our sympathy. He doesn't want our sympathy. He's victorious. He wants our worship. He wants our love. He wants our gratitude. Right? That's what he wants. But that's what he did. He's the ultimate warrior. He said, no greater, has, uh, no greater love has any man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Well, Jesus laid down his life for his enemies. I was one of them. And he died for me when I was his enemy. And he kept pursuing me, which is a mind boggler. But at the same time, what, what is he worthy from, from me? Loyalty. Gratitude. That's the way I take it, personally. His suffering just speaks of the value of his what? Sacrifice for me. Who else would do this for me? Nobody. Nobody. It's a rare occasion, right? The Bible talks about that. So he goes through all this stuff. Pilate is looking at this guy going, I find no fault. Well, he didn't confess any sins. <laughs> Being to a bloody pulp. Still didn't confess sins because there was no sin to confess. And Pilate has to begrudgingly say, I find no fault in him. They don't care. They don't care. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns, purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Behold the man. Um, now, 
There's a presentation here for us that you can't miss, and whether these people really understood what they were fulfilling, I do not know, but I'll read to you from Genesis chapter 3. Then Adam, then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, that doesn't mean, guys, you shouldn't listen to your wife. That's not what he's saying, but sometimes, you know, sometimes our wives probably shouldn't listen to us either. <laughs> Did I say that? No, I'm just kidding. Anyways, and you have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. Why the crown of thorns? He took the curse. The Bible declares he became a curse for us that we might become the righteousness of God. He took the curse. What was the curse? It wasn't just the ground. It was what? Death. It was eternal death. He took that. He made the payment. So there's a picture here of what? That the Romans are playing out here that they are fulfilling that he truly is what? The king of the curse. Oh, he's the son of God, and he's the, but he is taking as what? God's best, man's best, and he's taking what? He's taking the curse upon himself. So that's, that's kind of the picture, if you would have it. Um, so he says, I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing all of those things. He says, behold the man. You ever heard, you the man? Well, that's where this term comes from, you the man. No, there ain't no you the man. J.J. Dynamite is not the man. You know, neither was Elvis Presley or anybody else. The man is Jesus Christ, the ultimate man, right? Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Once again, I find no fault. You go do with this. I don't want to deal with it. The guy keeps trying to get away from what he has to do, finding an easy way to not offend either side, right? The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. There's another charge. So they bring another charge against him. So Pilate is going in and out. If you follow this, he goes into the court because the Jews can't go in there. So he goes into the praetorium. He goes in and sits on the bema seat. And then he comes back out and tells the Jews what he thought. So he's in, he's out. He's in, he's out. He's back and forth. And, you know, unfortunately, the guy's vacillating in his own heart. He doesn't know what to do. I don't want to deal with this. And so when he heard that he claimed to be the son of God, now you got to get the background of Pontius Pilate. Many of you have, have uh, watched movies, maybe uh, Gladiator or other movies, Roman movies. Well, what are they, what's the term that they use for God in, in, in Rome? It's not singular. It's plural. The gods. Right? The gods. Well, they just stole the Greek gods, and then they gave them new names. But they're the same gods. And they believed that certain people could become gods. That's why the Caesars decided to proclaim themselves to be God on planet Earth, right? Bow the knee. He's a god, right? And so they were very superstitious. You know, if things didn't go their way, then their God got up on the wrong side of the bed and he had a bad day. And they were going to have a bad day too because their God had a bad day. They just had to figure out which God of all the gods that they worshipped had a bad day. How do I appease the God that I don't know and I don't see? How do I make him happy? Well, this guy grew up underneath that kind of roll the dice kind of a... You know, if things are going really good, well, then God must be smiling on me, or that God's, right? And if things aren't going well, and I'm having problems, then God's having a bad day, and he's taking it out on me. Because he's just like human, right? 
Remember? Aphrodite and, you know, lust, adultery, right? <laughs> Fornication, right? What are the Greek gods like? Humans. Humans were supernatural powers which made them even worse than the average human, right? Well, you have to get the thinking of where, where Pilate is, and he's going, oh my gosh, this guy's claiming to be the Son of God. Maybe he is, because what? The testimony would be somebody quite different, right? And so maybe, maybe something's going on there. Um, and uh, so he doesn't know what to do. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more the more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power or authority to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, you have no power. You could have no power against uh, at all against me unless I, it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has greater sin. So what's he telling him? You're not in control. You're not in control. You're in control. You're controlled by so many other different things as humans can be. This guy's controlled by what? The political arena that he lives in, Rome and the Jews, right? The Jews hate him. He's there representing Rome, but if he starts a riot and a war with the Jews, Rome's not going to speak well of him, right? He's, he, that's not what he went there for. He's there to bring income and peace in a sense of Roman peace, Pax Romana is what they call it, Roman peace. Well, it was... Peaceful if you were a Roman citizen to a certain degree, but it wasn't peaceful if you were a subject and not a Roman citizen, right? It was tyrannical, right? But he's there to what? Make sure that the tax revenue flows into the Roman coffers. And then he's got what? All the other different persuasions about his own personal pride, his prestige, thinking about the raises that he will get or demotion if he would get it. So he's got all these extenuating factors and on top of it, he's bound by sin. He's not in control, he's being controlled. And Jesus tells him that plainly. You're not in control. You don't have the ultimate authority, neither does Rome, is what Jesus is actually going to say. You're not in control. And yet, what he said was designed to threaten Jesus, and Jesus says, I'm here to die to begin with. That's not what he said, but that's basically what he communicated with him. Do your best, buddy. Because that's what I'm here for. What do you do to somebody that you can't threaten with death? They're not afraid to die. What do you do with a person with that when you're, you know, live under tyrannical things? That is the story of many of the martyrs within the church over the years. Richard Wormbrandt and others. What do you do with a person like that that just doesn't take no and doesn't bow down to uh, tyrannical practices? You don't know what to do. Because it's so oxymoron to the person that's trying to just survive and thinking, what, temporal. When somebody thinks eternal, it changes the whole thing. When I realize my life is going to only be here for a certain amount of time, I just got to run the race. As a matter of fact, according to the Bible, I've already died. Now the life that I live, I live for Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean there's not benefits this, this side of heaven. There are benefits. But they're all futile if that's where I put my hope, is in the benefits of this world. Right? So, but he has no power. Not really, he has no power. 
and all the people that are around us and all the politicians, they all think they got power. Oh, they have a degree of power. Oh, they can make somebody's life miserable. Oh, they can do certain things. But what do you do with the person that's not afraid to die? How do you threaten that person? A person that's not afraid to lose everything. What do you do to a person? The world admires, people admire people like that. You know, that's why I love studying World War II history. I mean, there are just things where people just made choices and said, you know what, this is my time to give my life. There's a, a battle in uh, uh, Sariago Straits where um, we had a bunch of very small destroyers and uh, even frigates or, or destroyer escorts. Basically, they were ships with pea shooters. And the Japanese came through with battleships and cruisers. So our, gu our guys had five-inch guns, which seems like a big gun. It could have a big explosion. But their ships had 14, 18-inch guns, 8-inch guns, and lots of them. And they also had armor that was thick that typically a 5-inch gun wouldn't even, it would just bounce off. And yet at stake was all these little aircraft carriers with all these planes. And then beyond that was the beachhead where we were invading the Philippines, which had nobody to protect them. And for some reason, these guys, this group of, this group of ships, were stuck without any help from William Halsey with all the battleships and all the big carriers. They had gone away. So here's these little pea shooter guys, and they have to make a decision. They realize to turn and run is to leave these five carriers to be destroyed. Couldn't do that. They're here to defend them. And yet they can look out and see the size of these ships and go, <laughs> okay. Well, one of the guys says, you know what? We're going into battle, and the outcome is doubtful, but we're going nonetheless. And these five ships went straight into the head of these Japanese battleships, cruisers, and big destroyers. And the Japanese were so freaked out by these little ships and what they were doing in their attack, the Japanese surely thought there was a big fleet behind them, so they turned around and ran away. But it cost a lot of American lives. Three of those destroyers were sunk. Many of our sailors were died, but they died for a good cause the way that they saw it. This was our job, to give our lives and our ship for the sake of these others. What do you do with that? You see, the Japanese didn't know what to do with that. In fact, when they were leaving, one of the cruisers passed by one of the destroyers that were sinking. And the Japanese didn't shoot at them. They just stood at the deck and looked at them, almost like they were giving them a big salute, like, you guys are brave. If you know anything about the Japanese, they weren't into giving honor to somebody that didn't deserve it as a warrior. It's amazing. What do you do with that? How do you respond to that when people say, well, I might die here, but that's okay. I'm still going to do what I need to do. Well, that's Jesus to an umpteenth degree, right? I'm still gonna do what I'm gonna do. You have no authority. I know why I'm here and I know who's in control. And believe it or not, it's me. Because the Bible declares that he gave up his life. Nobody took it from him. He voluntarily gave it up. He's not a victim. He's a guy that gave his life as what? As a sacrifice, as a soldier would give his life for his friends. Jesus gave his life for what? All of us. Praise Lord. Even Pilate. Even the high priest. Right? So, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. He didn't know what to do. Oh my gosh, Pilate is just, you can see the guy just being torn. He's like, this guy's true, this guy's right, I need to let him go. But... If I do, all these other controlling, extenuating circumstances, they didn't teach me this in situation ethics class. What do I do now? Right? 
But the Druze cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. There they go. They just pulled the trump card on him. <laughs> they just did it. It's like, yeah, you're right. I'll never get a raise. I will be in bad situation with Rome. <laughs> And these guys know how to get to Rome. They have an audience with Rome. And so guess what? He couldn't go forward. He couldn't do what he knew that he needed to do was set him free. Embrace him for who he was. Because that's ultimately what he should have done is embraced him as his savior. But he didn't. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place which is called pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. In Mark or in Matthew chapter 27, it tells us at this point, Pilate asked for a bowl of water. And he washed his hands and says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. Was he? No, he wasn't. Because he was the judge. He was the ultimate authority, right? He represented Rome, the civil government. He wasn't innocent, right? But he tried to wash it. He tried to do everything he could. And he said, you go crucify him. It's on your heads. It's not the way that it works, is it? You can't just turn the blind eye to what? Injustice and say, I'm just. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I'm not watching. Right? Does that work? I don't hear it. Doesn't work. He already heard enough. He'd already seen enough. And he knew that he's making a choice, but he didn't know what that choice would ultimately lead him or cost him. According to certain traditions, and they believe Pilate, uh, in 1961, they found an inscription of Pilate. So they know that Pilate existed. There's many stories about what became a Pilate. They believe that he died um, about nine years after this and uh, that he was banished to France, Gaul, and uh, that he went insane, committed suicide. His wife had warned him, said, have nothing to do with that man. I've suffered many things because of him, which also produced some other fears and Right, anxiety, that he should have listened to his wife, right? <laughs> uh, and he didn't, because he thought of expediency, right? He thought of, well, I'll make this decision and I'll fix this decision somewhere down the road where I'll make another decision, I'll make up for it then. Uh, isn't that mankind? Nobody here has ever been in trouble, made a wrong choice. And then said, well, I'll fix this wrong choice with another choice. And you find out that's another wrong choice. Because we can make the choice, but we can't determine the outcome of the choice that we made, can we? We can't. That's why it says I should commit my way to the Lord. Leave those choices in His hands, right? You know, if you go to the candy store today or IV or wherever and... You know, you go there. There's no wrong choice for a candy bar you're going to get. God leaves that choice to you. Which one do you like? Right? But in major course decisions of my life, moral decisions, guess what? I need help. Because I'm just like Saul. I'm just like Pilate. I can't make one because I'm bound by so many different relationships and so many other different things. So, anyway, keep moving, Dennis. He washed his hands. He was the judge of Rome. So, I ask you again, who was really on trial here? Wasn't it Pilate? What are you going to do, Pilate? 
What are you going to do with the situation? So, um, then he bearing his cross went out to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, and where they crucified him, two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title, put on the cross, and what was written, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests and the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but he said, I am the King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. So, is it an accusation? You see, typically what they would put on the top of the cross, there's about four different crosses that Rome used. The estimation is the pole went above his head and they put the placard up there. And it usually was the crimes that the person committed. But why was Jesus being crucified? Because he was the Son of God. That's why mankind rejected the Son of God. So it's a reality that he was the Son of God, but he's also being condemned because he's the Son of God, and man rejects what? God's ways. It's a picture, definitely a picture. And in this is Pilate's final word. He's basically being sarcastic to the Jews and saying, I don't care what you think. That's what I wrote. You're going to have to live with it, boys. Right? I'm going to speed up because I always have to speed up because uh, it's just the nature of things. Um, on the last three hours, it tells us that what? It turned dark. Right? And that's when the wrath of God was poured out. That's when the anguish truly came because that's when man's sin, my sin, was put on Jesus. Isaiah 53, you can read it for yourself. He was crushed, he was bruised. He was broken for me, that he would make atonement for me. That's what he did. That's where the atonement was made, right? Um, as a way of a contrast, though, we get into after Jesus is crucified. Um, I, 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 verse 30, it says, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and bowed his head. And he gave up his spirit. The word for it is finished means paid for in full. It was what you stamped when you bought a home. And then when you finally paid it off, it would say paid for in full. What did he pay for? He paid for me. He paid for us. In fact, it says that uh, for the treasure in the field, he bought the whole field. Right? In other words, he had to redeem the whole world to get the treasure. What's the treasure? Who's the treasure? We are. And everybody then responds. Pilate could have been a, one of the responders. I don't know how that would have worked out in God's economy, but he could have. He could have responded. Everybody has the opportunity to respond. Because when people stand before the judge of all eternity, they're going to have no excuse. They're not going to be able to say, well, you're the one that sent me to hell because you wouldn't change my heart. No, God gave everybody the opportunity, everybody, the opportunity to respond. The Bible declares that man ripens himself for judgment. God doesn't ripen the man or the woman. Um, so this is a proclamation of victory. It's Finished! I accomplished the task. It says he gave up his spirit. He gave up his spirit. Well, it means he actually rested. Where did he rest? He says birds have nests to rest in, right? But the Son of Man has no place to what? Lay his head. Well, the word for rest, it says he rested at the cross. He rested from what? from his work. His work was over, right? So, then you have the centurion, who when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. That is obviously him looking at somebody being crucified 
And he had seen lots of crucifixes because he was a Roman centurion. He was a leader of a group of people. He had seen lots of people crucified. Never watched a man like this get crucified, responding the way that he did. It says when he saw these things, some say that's the earthquake and other things. I believe it was the very man that he was watching on that cross and listening to his statements and seeing the character and the nature of him even though he's a bloody pulp, had every reason to be bitter and angry, but he wasn't. He loved people from that cross and every statement that he made other than one. Um, commending his spirit to the Father. I'm going to read you something real quick, so bear with me. Um, Right after this, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus come and get the body. Both of them were part of the Sanhedrin. Both of them were leaders. Both of them were secret followers of Jesus. But guess what? They came out in the public. They came out in the public to get his body, a cursed body. They went outside of the camp and they took his body down and out of love, and admiration, they cleaned up his body. They wrapped his body, they put it in spices, and then Joseph loaned him his tomb for three days. Right? But they went outside. They were no longer hiding. They had to come out and make the public proclamation, we're followers of Jesus. It would cost them. Right? No more situational ethics for these guys. You know what? They were like, you know, darn the torpedoes full speed ahead. That's what they did. And you know what? Everybody that follows Jesus has to do the same thing. You can't hide. You have to come out in public. You have to make your proclamation. There's no middle secret ground. I'm not saying that these guys weren't secret in their belief. They were. But ultimately, they had to come out in the open and make a stand. That's what the Bible declares about us, right? Well, let me uh, speak about the mercy of God here. Genesis 7, 1 through 5. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, to each of the animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Also seven each of the birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days I will cause it to rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Then those, verse 16, that entered the ark, or entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The Lord closed the door. He said, come into the ark. There's a seven-day period. Seven-day period. And some scholars say, well, they, God closed the door the first day and they sat in there for seven days with the door closed. Why would God do that? Na 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 na, we're running around, na na na. You know, I don't see that in the nature of God. What I see in the nature of God is He left the door open. I think it was 322 cattle cars worth of space in the ark. If you took all the animals and you took all the people, there'd be a whole lot more space. I think the door was left wide open for anybody that wanted to get on the ark. But nobody did. And then on the seventh day, God said, I closed the door. By the way, Methuselah had just died. You guys know who Methuselah is, right? 969 years, he lived longer than any other man on the planet. <clears throat> Let me read you uh, a group of, uh, well, the names of what we would call the patriarchs of uh, pre-flood. Uh, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalel, 
Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Here's what their names mean. Their Hebrew meaning. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Man appointed. Enos means mortal. Man appointed mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalel, the blessed God. Man appointed mortal sorrow, blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch says teaching. Methuselah says his death shall bring. Lamech, the despairing. Noah means rest or comfort. Let me just read it. Man appointed mortal sorrow, the blessed God shall come down teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest and comfort. I don't know if you've ever known that or heard that. I heard that years ago. So what is it speaking of? It's speaking of Jesus Christ, right? Methuselah lived the longest. His name means when he dies, it shall come. It was about the judgment. Why did he live the longest? Because that's God's nature is to be merciful. He didn't just close the door on the first day. He left it open for seven days and said, if you want to come in, what does the ark represent? Well, it has pitch on the inside and on the outside. Do you know what pitch is? Kofar. This is where we get the term Yom Kippur. Covering. It's the atonement. I'm atoned for in Jesus Christ. I'm safe inside. Because God said, come into the ark. Come into my salvation. Come into my deliverance. He would say to us, come into Jesus Christ. Embrace him you will find security and rest. You will be born again, and you won't have to live in the fear of what death will bring when it comes, because it comes for all of us, right? I encourage you today, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, in the same way as those people could have walked up the ramp to get into the ark, you can open your heart to the Lord, spiritually speaking. Make an agreement with Him and say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you made my payment for me. I believe you rose from the dead, and I believe that you're coming back. I want to be with you. I want to be ready when you come back. I want you to be my Savior. I realize you paid for me. I realize I can be part of your treasure. Lord, would you make me part of your treasure? And if you will confess Jesus as your Savior in those terms, then God will cause you to become his child because he's made the payment for your sin. You don't have to pay for it yourself. You can't. And you will start a new relationship and that will grow. Right? But there's the door. You walk through the door, then you go in and you begin to grow. If you've never done that, I encourage you today to do it. You can turn to the person next to you or one of the people here and say, how do I do this? Would you pray with me? Guess what? God takes you at his word or takes you at your word if you will take him at his word. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever confesses me before man, I will confess him before my father. It's public. It ultimately needs to be a public confession, a public statement. Father, thank you for your word. Those who came to hear it, Lord, we thank you so much for your love sacrifice for us. Lord, I just pray that your spirit would work in us. We are so grateful that we're your treasure. We're the pearl of great price, that you loved us so much. So Lord, I ask and pray that you bless us right now as we sing. Bless us as we go out the door. Bless us this week. Bless our marriages. Bless our relationship with our kids. Bless us as single people. 
Just bless us as your children, Lord. Pour out your spirit. Fill our hearts with the love of God, as it says in the book of Romans. And Lord, show us what is good and right as we walk with you, Lord. How to take advantage and redeem the time that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.